Kazushi Sakuraba is a name you probably heard of if you're an MMA fan, and it's probably even a name you know you should respect. And it's true that he retired a little too late and took some beatings and hurt his record later in his career because of it. But in my opinion, most people don't realize just how influential and how much of a pioneer Sakuraba has been in the world of MMA. Considering just how he started and what he accomplished, Sakuraba is undoubtedly a man that everyone should know as one of the greatest in the sport. Let's get into why. Sakuraba's foray into the world of fighting began not with MMA, but with pro wrestling. As a kid, he became a fan of Tiger Mask, a Japanese manga series about a vicious, evil wrestler trying to become a heroic face. He was initially tempted to drop out of school entirely to pursue wrestling, but was eventually convinced to instead join his school's amateur wrestling team. He was a fast standout, ending up second in the nation as a high school wrestler. In college, he won the East Japan Freshman Championship and served as Chuo University's team captain. After college, he dove head-on into proper professional wrestling. Now, my audience is pretty American for the most part, or Western at least, and when you think of pro wrestling, you think of wrestlers like Hulk Hogan, The Undertaker, you think of these heightened gimmicks. As fun as they can be, the professional wrestling we're talking about here is pretty different. The UWF International still had predetermined outcomes to its matches, it's true, but there was a real attempt made for the matches to look realistic, grounded, and legitimately dangerous. The group hired big names in not just pro wrestling, but legitimate martial arts to sell this image. As a result, the fighters trained under wrestlers like Billy Robinson and Yoji Anjo, but also learned techniques of martial arts like Muay Thai. This means that even though the wrestlers are acting out a determined outcome in a sense, they're also learning real martial arts skills that can make them formidable opponents in combat sports like mixed martial arts. And yes, this is foreshadowing. Anyway, by 1995, Sakuraba had slowly crawled his way up the ladder at the UWF. But that year, the UWF began a feud event with another wrestling group, New Japan Pro Wrestling. Now, New Japan Pro Wrestling had some way bigger fighters, leading to the UWF fighters to be forced into matches where they were the losers. This in turn caused the UWF to lose standing in terms of marketability. And at the same time, as if that wasn't enough, there was the impending threat of MMA. Yoji Anjo, one of the fighters that had trained Sakuraba, went to the United States to challenge Hicks and Gracie, one of a long line of the famed Gracie family fighters. Japanese press gathered for the event and they saw Yoji Anjo lose brutally. It had the opposite of the intended effect, with the UWF losing even more standing. It's sort of like you try to put out a fire, but that bucket of water actually turns out to be motor oil. In December of 1996, the UWF shut down. Kazushi Sakuraba headlined for the first time at their final match, beating his opponent by submission. The Gracie family had been partially responsible for the downturn of the UWF, but this would not be the only time they would cross paths with Sakuraba. After the UWF shut down, Sakuraba went to another wrestling group, Kingdom Pro Wrestling. This organization was largely run by Nobuhiko Takata, a man who had trained Sakuraba while he was with the UWF. But by this point, mixed martial arts had exploded in popularity in Japan, and there wasn't as much room for a new company to establish a foothold in the wrestling space. Not helping matters was once again that pesky little issue with the Gracie family. I myself trained at the Henzo Gracie Academy. I got my black belt under John Danahar and Henzo Gracie, so I know what kind of fighters the school breeds. The Gracie family is still known and respected today, and the fighters they train are still known to be fearsome, powerful, and disciplined, and handsome. But at the point in time we're talking about in the 90s, they were basically in a league of their own, kind of literally. Horion Gracie was instrumental in bringing the UFC to life since he organized the very first event himself in Colorado along the promoter Art Davey. In that event, there had been a fighter by the name of Hoist Gracie, Horion's brother, another member of the Gracie family. You'll see a very strategic guy here. You saw a kick by Hoist. Now, Hoist wasn't the guy you'd think the Gracie family would pick to be their fighter in the event. He was a smaller guy, especially compared to his brother Hicks and Gracie. But this was a deliberate choice. Horion picked one of the physically smaller members of the family in order to better showcase the sheer strength of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. A bit of a gamble, maybe, but ultimately a successful one. Hoist ultimately went on to win UFC 1 in 1993, rocketing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and the Gracie family to fame internationally nationally, but especially in the United States. But 
but they didn't get famous overnight in every country. It took a while, for example, in Japan. Which brings us back to Yoji Anjo's fight with Hicks and Gracie in the US. While the biggest federation in Japanese wrestling, New Japan Pro Wrestling, was still doing just fine, the wrestlers involved in Kingdom Pro Wrestling had suffered in the public eye because of the Gracie family's dominance in mixed martial arts. It might seem a little silly at first glance, since the outcomes of the matches were already predetermined, but these were matches that were actively trying to look grounded and real, with fighters that were really trying to sell the dangerous moves. In 1997, Sakuraba's trainer and one of the heads of Kingdom Pro Wrestling, Nobuhiko Takada, delved into the world of mixed martial arts. The very first Pride Championship fighting event was conceived to match up Takada with Hicks and Gracie. Hickson had won the Valley Tudo Japan annual MMA tournament in 1994 and 1995, growing his popularity in the country. He had also, of course, beaten Yoji Anjo just a few years prior. Kata is not giving up the takedown. Oh. Kata with a knee, back position, beautiful nice. tight double. And that's not to mention that he was coming into the fight with an undefeated record. The Pride event was seen not just as a normal MMA fight, but as a chance for Takata to restore the reputation of his former promotion. This is the kind of storytelling that wrestling has to have a team of writers to conceive. You've got blood feuds, outside international fighters going up against the traditional local guys, restoring honor and reputation. It's like a storybook. And here it was just unfolding out in the real world. In a storybook though, Takata would probably train harder than he has ever trained before and either beat the odds to emerge victorious or at the very least surprise everyone with his unbelievable performance. That's not exactly what happened. Gracie dominated the fight, beating Takata in the first round. Takata's got the hands locked. Takata taps out. That was a quick one, folks. That was a quick one. Sakuraba, meanwhile, managed to become a headlining event at Kingdom Wrestling just shortly after Takata's bout. In December of 1997, Sakuraba had found himself as the last minute replacement at UFC Japan. A couple other fighters from Kingdom Wrestling had signed on to the event to promote Kingdom Wrestling, but one of them had faced an injury, forcing Sakuraba to take the match on against Conan Silvera. And this event, it was really weird. Not only was Sakuraba a last minute addition, he'd also lied about his weight to qualify for the match. His opponent, Silvera, out weighed him by over 50 pounds. In the initial matchup, Severa did incredible damage on Sakuraba, leading the referee to think that Sakuraba was knocked out and that the match was over. But after loud protests from the audience and a review of the tapes, the ref declared the match a no contest. This might have been the end of the night for Sakuraba, but it got even stranger that night. This is where it gets crazy. The event managers did something that was quite literally unprecedented. They got Sakuraba and Silvera in a rematch the same night. We start again, Severa had success on his feet. Correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I'm concerned, this has never happened before or since. Seeing both of these fighters in the ring is almost comical. I mean, Silvera dwarfed Sakuraba. It was a proper David versus Goliath matchup. And in the first round of the fight, Sakuraba won against all odds. Armbar, that's it! Sakuraba taps out from that Silvera! On the wrestling side, this matchup gave him a ton of credibility. But despite his increased popularity, Kingdom Pro Wrestling folded in March of 1998. After the fall of Kingdom Pro Wrestling, Sakuraba shifted focus to mixed martial arts. His unorthodox match with Silvera would be his last match in the UFC, but he began taking on Pride Championship matches, starting with the second event, Pride 2. His bombastic, entertaining style quickly made him a fan favorite, along with the fact that he would be willing to take on challenges way out of his weight class, just like he had done with Silvera. Meanwhile, the Gracie family continued to spread the hype around Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and keep a stronghold over Japanese audiences. In Pride 8, in 19 in 1999, the two forces of Sakuraba and the Gracies finally came to a head. Kazushi Sakuraba was assigned to square off against Hoyla Gracie. Hoyla's previous fight had been in 1998 against Yuhi Sano, yet another teammate of Sakuraba's that had gone on to be beaten by the Gracie family. Hoyla was coming into this match as the favorite with an undefeated record. It was, however, one of the few times in his career that Sakuraba had a decent size advantage in the fight, since he weighed over 20 pounds more than Hoyla. During the fight, Sakuraba utilized strong defense and used constant leg kicks to keep Gracie at distance and on his back. He stayed off the ground, which is where Gracie believed he had a distinct advantage. Look at that. Oh, oh, this fight oh, may be oh. on the verge of being over. Sakuraba just going crazy here with a right roundhouse kick. In round two though, Sakuraba finally went to the ground with Gracie and managed to lock on a Kimura. Okay, the referee has moved in. The referee is waiting to fight off. The referee 
has stopped the fight. This was the first major loss by the Gracie family in decades, and the very first one since they had become truly dominant in the world of MMA. The Gracie family, well, let's just say they didn't take kindly to this. For one thing, the match ended by the referee declaring Sakuraba the winner. Hoyler never actually tapped out to the Kimura. The moment was seen as controversial by some fans and the Gracie family, who seemed to think maybe there was some favoritism going on. This didn't change the audience reception of the fight though. For another thing, Sakuraba was probably not the guy you wanted challenging your legacy as a lineage of the world's greatest fighters. He was talented, no doubt, but he valued entertaining a crowd and showcasing flashy maneuvers over pure, dry, disciplined fighting. He was also a drinker and a smoker, sometimes smoking right before matches. Anyway, for the first time in decades, the Gracie family image of utter dominance had been shaken and the Gracies were eager to settle the score. At first, Sakuraba challenged Hicks and Gracie, who was in Hoyler's corner during the fight, to a match right as Sakuraba won, but Hicks and Gracie retired before that particular match could materialize. Instead, Kazushi Sakuraba faced off against a different member of the Gracie family in the 2000 Pride Grand Prix during the event's quarterfinals. Hoist Gracie, the man, the myth, the legend. This time around, the rules of the match were changed to make sure nothing like the match against Hoyler happened again. The Gracie family demanded special rules for the match. An unlimited number of 15-minute rounds, no judges, only knockouts or submissions. While the demands seemed ridiculous at first glance, probably because they were, Sakuraba eventually accepted the terms. The result of this matchup was a fight that is widely considered one of the greatest matches in mixed martial arts history. The fight went on for over 90 minutes which still stands as an MMA record. Sakuraba came out dressed up with a mask with two other fighters flanking him wearing identical outfits. Once in the ring, he took the attire off to reveal he had bright orange hair. This sense of theatricality didn't just stop in the pre-fight moments either. Throughout the fight, Sakuraba would smile to the camera, do fancy maneuvers, and really show off his pro wrestling blood throughout the match. For Sakuraba, this wasn't just a fight, it was a chance to truly showcase the strength of Japanese pro wrestling, his first love and passion, against the wildly hyped up art of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And what a way to showcase it. By the fifth round, Sakuraba was displaying unbelievable stamina, while Hoist was clearly struggling to stand. Finally, at the sixth round, Hoist's corner threw in the towel, giving Sakuraba the win by TKO. The match ended with one of the biggest ovations you could have ever seen in your life, and with good reason. It also earned Sakuraba the nickname of the Gracie Hunter. He only further cemented that reputation later that very same year. In August of 2000, Sakuraba fought Henzo Gracie at Pride 11 and won by Vicious Kimura in the second round. He actually broke Henzo's arm. He won yet another fight in December of the same year against High and Gracie. His fighting career outside of winning against the Gracies was not always as universally praised or dominant, but being the undefeated Gracie killer was a badge that he held for seven years. In June of 2007, Sakuraba was beaten by Hoist Gracie in a rematch for Dynamite USA. However, Hoist Gracie would go on to test positive for steroids used after the match. Even though the judge's decision wasn't overturned, the victory rang pretty hollow in the eyes of a lot of fans. For many, Sakuraba wouldn't truly lose to a member of the Gracie clan until his match with Halleck Gracie in 2010. And by that point, Sakuraba was way past his prime, already had fans calling for him to retire for his own health and safety, and was fighting a guy who was 15 years younger than him. By the end of his MMA career, Kazushi Sakuraba went on a five-match losing streak before finally retiring with a final record of 26 wins and 17 losses, with a lot of those losses stacking up in the back half of his career. Nowadays, Sakuraba has created Quintet, a team-based grappling promotion that's in collaboration with the UFC. He was inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame in 2017. Kazushi Sakuraba is a man that loved pro wrestling first and foremost, so much so that he brought the spirit of wrestling with him into every other sport he touched. He had a long career as one of the most fearsome, compelling, and just plain fun fighters to watch. He's a born entertainer and one of the best to ever do it.